we're in a series called Why Me? And uh, we're taking the Bible, just going straight through it, all right? And so in Kids Church, in student ministry, we're all in the same story. The story we're in today is where God feeds over a million people just food out of the sky for 40 years. Years. It's an amazing story. They're stuck in the desert and they're asking lots of questions. Last week, why am I under attack? I hope you saw that message. You were a part of that. If not, check it out online. This week, why can't I get ahead? This is a very interesting story. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. I, I mean, I literally love this story. As I was studying it this week, some new things came alive to me and we're just going to read it together, okay? Exodus 16 and 1, it says, Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam, journeyed into the wilderness of Sin, between Elam and Mount Sinai. Okay, they arrived on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. Now, here's where it gets interesting. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained. Everybody say complained. Complained Complained about Moses and Aaron. All right, I have to stop right here. This is not a part of really the topic I'm preaching on, but this word complained is really very interesting. It's a unique Hebrew word. The Old Testament was not written in English, so translators have to make a decision about what this word means. And that word is the Hebrew word loon, and it's translated often as complain or murmur. Okay, we know what that means. But much more often, it's translated as the word lodge or to stay somewhere. It's also translated as abide remain, tarry, spend the night, continue, endure, or dwell. It's most often, it means a location that you make camp in. Complaining becomes a location that you camp out in. Does anybody catch that? That when you are the complainer, I don't care where it is, if you're the grumbler, the murmur, the complainer, where you work, everybody knows who that complainer is at work, right? You got somebody in your mind just constantly negative all the time. If you don't have someone in mind right now, someone has you in mind right now. <laughs> There's always somebody. And their complaining never gets anything better. Never makes It becomes the place that you live. Literally, these people were promised a land that flows with milk and honey. That's where God wanted them to go. They traded it in to complain. Literally an entire generation of people missed the promised land because they were murmuring. And so here's the unescapable conclusion that I want to tell you is that negativity is its own destination. If you're negative, it's not going to get any better. If you're just constantly pointing out everything that went wrong, it doesn't take any creativity or any insight. No faith is required to just point out the obvious that things aren't going well. So don't be a negative Nancy. Sorry to the ladies, don't be a negative Ned, okay? It's the destination. It doesn't get you anywhere, okay? Now, here's the good news. I am not preaching on that today. I just could not skip that. It's right there in the story. Now, let's go to verse 3. Here's what I'm actually preaching about. If only the Lord, they continue to complain. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and all the bread we wanted, but now you have brought us out into this wilderness and you're going to starve us to death. That sounds perfect. Like we, got, we had all the food back there. We ate all we wanted. We just sat around pots filled with food. Now, that is not at all true. They worked 18-hour days. They were slaves. Much of the New Testament, this is the Old Testament, much in the New Testament where they talk about slavery is actually not slavery that we think of. It's, it's more indentured servanthood where people uh, paid off a debt through slavery. But this was the actual most horrible form of slavery. Their wives and, 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 and girls were raped. Their, their, their sons and, and husbands were murdered. They were starved. They worked 18-hour days. And here they're talking about how we just sat around and ate all the food. We, you see how complaining becomes the spirit of irrationality in your life. And that's where they were. It's a horrible way. Now, verse 4 continues. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven on each of you. Each day the people can go out and pick up the food as much as they need for the day. And I will test them. Everybody say Test. I will test them, I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Now, here's the point I really want to make, that God's blessing is always a what? Trust test. He is going to test them to see, do you trust yourself or do you trust 
me. God's going to rain down all this food. And he says, even though there's enough for millions of people, what do you think would happen? And we've already seen in pop culture. If like just a giant pile of money fell somewhere, would you just take one dollar? <laughs> and say, well, I want to make sure there's enough for everybody else there. No, we've seen in American culture, like you, people just try to grab it all. This is, this is the test they're under. God says, I'm going to put plenty out there for everyone, but only take what you need. And in this, I'm going to read it again, I will test them to see whether or not they trust me. Every blessing of God is a test in your life. When God gives it to you, he's now going to test if you do it, do with it what he wanted you to do with it. And the number one trust test every believer will ever have, the hardest one, is the tithing test. The Bible says to bring the first 10% of your income into the Lord's house. He said, it's my blessing over your life. It belongs to me. It's the most difficult test, and most Christians will never pass that test. They'll come into the house of God and worship him and say, God, I'll trust you with everything. And God says, what about 10%? And they go, well, I didn't really mean everything. <laughs> you know, that's a lot, you know. And we usually don't pass that test. 10 is the number of God's testing. Everybody say 10. I'm going to give you a little test here. All right, you ready for this? Uh, how much is the tithe? What percent? Ten's the number of testing. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, and you may not know all the answers, but I bet you can figure it out. How many plagues did God give Egypt to test the Pharaoh's heart? Ten. Ten. See, you're getting it. How many commandments are there? Ten. Ten. How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? I bet you know. Come on, take a guess. There you go. It's in Numbers chapter 14, but it was 10 times. How many times were Jacob's wages changed in that story? 10. Come on, guys. I bet you know this answer better. Help me out. How many times? 10. All right, let's keep going. How many days was Daniel tested? 10. 10 times. I knew you'd get it. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25 in Jesus' story? How many? 10. There were 10. How many days of testing does Revelation 2 say there's going to be? Ten. How many disciples did Jesus have? Uh, Twelve. I was just testing you on that one. Okay. All right. So ten is the number of testing. And, and that number of testing is very difficult, and, and you'll never have a tougher test than the tithe. Now, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul established all these churches, Rome, Galatia, uh, Corinthia, all these, Philippi, all these different churches. And, and much of the New Testament is his writing to tell those churches how to live, how to worship, how to trust God. Here's what he said in, to the church at Corinth. He said, on every Sunday, put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for the what? The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. That's very straightforward, and it is the tithe. It's, these are Jews. They understood the tithe. This is an explanation of it. And if you've never tithed, it's very difficult when you first start because our culture does not teach you to spend 90% of your income, does it? It teaches you to spend 110% of your income. That's what most Americans do. They earn 100%. They spend 100% and borrow 10% more. That's a way our culture lives. Now, here at Daystar, we don't teach the 110 plan. We teach the, what we call the 10 10 80 plan. The first 10% goes to the Lord. The second 10% goes to your future, and you live on 80%. I can't tell you how much confidence and peace you can have in your life when you know not every dollar has got to go to pay my bills. I would love for everyone to live that way. I've lived it that way my whole life, my adult life at least. In 1995, my wife and I, we went in ministry uh, and I earned $10,000. I was a full-time youth pastor and had three part-time jobs. And all that work earned me the grand old sum of $10,000. And we decided then we needed more than the blessing of the tithe. We needed to double tithe. That's when we decided we're going to double tithe. <laughs> You say, well, you know, I, I thought if we only earned $10,000, we'd starve on $10,000, so we might as well give the tithe. That way we could just starve on $9,000. And then we just decided, you know what we're going to do? We can get radical. We're going to start double tithing, and then we can starve on $8,000. Guess what happened? We didn't starve. God showed up in our lives. We tested God, and God blessed us. See, God's blessing is always a trust test. Are you with me? Look at your neighbor and say, let's get through this together. It's going to be all right. I'm here for you. All right. Verse number five picks up and says this. On the sixth day, they'll gather food. And when they prepare it, there'll be twice as much as usual. 
So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there's, there's just enough. On Saturday, on the fifth day, there's twice as much. That would have been Friday for them. Twice as much. Why, why did he not want them to gather anything on the next day? Because he wanted them to trust him. And he says, and this is also one of the Ten Commandments, God says, I want one day of every week where you do not work at all. You know, it occurs to me that the tithe test is really hard, and it's a trust test, and the Sabbath test is really hard. It's also a trust test. That's the one I have failed personally, just honestly, the most, because I think I got to go make it happen. I got to go work harder. I got to go make stuff happen. You know, I got to, you know, work, work hard enough and pull myself up by my bootstraps, roll my sleeves up and make something happen. You know what I'm telling God? I don't trust you, God, enough to follow your principles and rest on the Lord's day. So I'm going to work and make it happen all my own. These are both trust tests and we tend to fail them. Somebody say amen. amen. If you say amen, I move on. If you don't, I go back from the top because I got to convince you this is true. All right, number 13, let's start reading from verse 13. That evening, vast numbers of quail flew in, covered the whole camp. The next morning, the area where the camp was wet with dew. And when the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as, frosted, uh, as frost blanketed the ground. And the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it, they asked. It's interesting, the word manna literally is a Hebrew word that translates, what is it? That's what manna meant. Like they were like, I don't know what this is. Sounds like awesome food, right? What is this? They had no idea what it was. And Moses said to them, it's the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs and pick two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. Those who gathered only a little had enough. And each family had just what it needed. Then Moses said to them, do not keep any of it until morning. Here's where it went sideways. But some of them did not listen, and they kept some of it till morning. We're just trying to get ahead, right? I'm just trying to get ahead, right? I'm just going to violate what God says. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell, and Moses was very angry with them. What's going on here? God is providing with a, you know, a massive amount of blessing, but he says, here's what I need you to do with that blessing. God is blessing, and they are hoarding. Everybody say hoarding. Hoarding doesn't work. It turns into maggots and it makes everything stink. I know people who make insane sums of money, but their home life stinks because they're hoarding, all right? And it stinks. It's always going to hoard. Why, uh, hoarding is always going to do that. Why can't I get ahead? Well, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, wrote this. He says it's possible to give away and become what? That doesn't make sense. That must be a principle of the kingdom because it doesn't make sense in our culture. It's also possible to what? Hold on too tightly and lose everything. Yes, the generous man will be rich and by watering others, he waters himself. Now, is it in our culture to release it or to grab it and hold on? This is, this is the problem when we hold on too tightly. We begin to hoard it. And there's a guy named James I told you Paul started and established all these churches. James, he only has one book of the Bible, but he, he writes to re really all the churches. And here he says something about hoarding. He says, your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Why? Because you have done what? Say it with me. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. So why can't I get ahead? Well, we hoard. Amer it's the American way of life. There is no nation on planet Earth who's ever hoarded like Americans have. We're all guilty of it. I just looked this up this week. I noticed 3% of all the children in the world live in the United States. And those 3% of children own 40% of all the toys in the world. Can you believe that? And, and uh, an average 10-year-old has 238 toys and he plays with 12. And three cardboard boxes, right? That's where our kids are. Average woman owns, uh-oh, why did I put women in here? Owns 30 outfits. One man in an early service said, baby, you are just so far ahead of culture. 
In, in 1930, the average woman owned nine cents. By the way, I own more than the average woman. I'll just confess. The average U.S. family throws away 62 pounds of clothes every year. The average home has more TVs in it than it has people in it. And the average U.S. home tripled in size in the last 50 years, and still 38% of us rent storage units right now. We are a nation of hoarders. We just are. That's just, that's just kind of how we are. Now, since I've offended some of y'all already, let me preach about me for a while, okay? Let me just preach about me for a while, okay? I was on a plane with a, I was coming back from a mission trip connecting through London, and there was a British lawyer on the plane. And he said, I, when we talked, he said, I really want to visit America because I've heard that you all have cars. He said, I live in London. Very few people have a car. I don't have a car. And he said, I've heard y'all all love your cars so much, you bring them in the house with you. <laughs> He's talking about garages. <laughs> I never thought about it. You know, that, that the rest of the world doesn't have garages, but we have, gar, we have multiple car garages, we have carports, we have sheds, and if you drive around Coleman County, we have sheds leaning against sheds that lean against sheds. <laughs> we have some stuff, y'all. Let me talk about my garage, okay? My garage, I was just looking around in while I was writing this sermon, three sets of golf clubs in there. I can't hit any of them straight. <laughs> if I buy one more set, I am convinced it's going to go straight. <laughs> I have more deer rifles in there than deer I have harvested to eat this year because that's what I tell my wife why I need that deer rifle because I'm going to go kill a deer and we're going to eat it and we're going to be healthy and it's cheap, okay? I'll move on, you deer guys. You have rifles, so I don't want you shooting me. I have more pairs of shoes than I can wear at one time. I have shoes I haven't worn all year long, shirts, pants, hats. We have two exercise machines. One holds a, a stack of books right now. Uh, the other one's in storage. But don't worry, I have a gym membership too. I have three bikes in the garage. I don't remember when anybody rode one. And we have balls everywhere. Baseballs, tennis balls, basketballs. We have so many basketballs, right? If you, if you take in the groceries, you better watch where you, you will step on a ball of some kind in our house. We have an indoor basketball, an outdoor basketball. We have a size six basketball, size seven basketball. We have an extra heavy basketball to teach you how to dribble. We have a yellow basketball that when you, it connects to the internet and coaches you. Man, we got some basketball. Last year, I, 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 I coached my, my son's baseball team, bats everywhere. Every kid got one, two, three bats. I was looking in there like there's a bat dad. There's a dad had so many bats in the back of his truck like he was dealing drugs. He looked at your kid's <laughs> bat. He's like, man, let me tell you what I got back here. I could... It's just bats everywhere. At one point, we, we kept striking out. I looked over there and I told Leslie, there are more bats in our dugout than there, we have had hits this season. We could have used one kid's bat and all struck out with the same bat and saved thousands of dollars. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I've got them all upset with me about the bats. I'm just talking about me. I don't know what y'all do. James says this won't work. When we are a nation of hoarders, this wealth will stink and it won't work for us. So I want to answer the question. As I was reading this story, I feel like it's a question many of us are asking, why can't I get ahead? All right, here's, here's a few answers. Number one, maybe you're a slave to the lender. Did you know that's in the Bible? You can look it up, Proverbs 22 and 7. It says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. You see, the vast majority of Americans are in financial slavery by definition. How do you know if you're in financial slavery? Well, have you ever felt like God is leading you to do something, but you can't afford to do it? Or there's no way for you to get there? Well, that's financial slavery. God wouldn't ask you to do something that you can't do. Well, I, I think we're supposed to get married, but we can't afford to. Well, I'll, I'll marry you for free, by the way. I've been doing it for many years. If that's the thing you need to do, all right. Maybe God's calling you to tithe, and you say, well, I can't afford to do that. Maybe you are a tither. God's called you to be an extravagant giver. You want to really, help build orphanages or do something extravagant like that. You can't afford to do it. Maybe God, you feel like he's calling you to be a foster parent but you can't afford what it costs to do that. Or God's calling you to adopt, but you're afraid you can't afford it. Maybe you're a two-income family. You think God really would have you to be a one-income family. You're going to homeschool or maybe just be a stay-at-home mom uh, to support the children, but you can't afford to do that. That's, that's financial bondage. And the good news is God can get you out of that, but it won't happen uh, just by chance. You'll have to be specific and intentional about it. See, it's our nation's culture to spend uncontrolled, 
Uncontrolled spending is what our nation, our government demonstrates for us as we are in debt $34 trillion. Did you know if you had a stack of $100 bills and you could fill up every, this auditorium and every Daystar Church auditorium at all our campuses with $100 bills, you could not put $34 trillion in the building. There's not enough room for it. If you want to try, we will receive it and use it for Jesus. <laughs> But it won't fit. That, that, I mean, that, can you just get, wrap your head around how much overspending our... By the way, we have more money than any country in the world. We have a bigger budget. We ought to be able to make it without doing that. In fact, today and every day, our country will spend $2 billion, with a B, $2 billion on interest payments alone. That hurts my heart because I've been trying to raise a half a million dollars to house several hundred orphan children in Africa for about a year, and our country will throw away $2 billion today and tomorrow and the day after that. Pastor, are you mad at the Democrats? Yes, I am. Are you mad at the Republicans? Absolutely, they got the same disease. Are you mad at Joe Biden? Yes, I am. And I'm also mad at Donald Trump because it's a nation full of people who think our solution is to spend, 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 spend. We have violated and given up on all the biblical principles God has given us. Don't do it. Don't go with the flow. Don't let your family look like the rest of this culture. If you do, you're going to be a slave to the lender. That may be why you can't get ahead. Number two reason, maybe you've been deceived. There are a lot of financial lies our culture just buys hook, line, and sinker. We get busy. We get in a hurry. We just do what everybody tells us to do, and we believe a few lies. Here's some of the lies. Number one, I deserve a better life now. You're 23 years old. You're 25 years old. You look at what your parents have. You think you should have that? Same car, same home, same lifestyle. They worked and saved for 30 years to get there. Culture says you ought to have it right now. And guess what? You can have it. You just got to go into deep, oppressive, dangerous debt to get there. Don't believe that lie. Save. Wait. Be disciplined. Be generous. Take your time, and God will get you there in a healthy way. Somebody help me and say amen. amen. I told you I'll start back over at the top if you don't say amen. Okay. Second lie we believe is that there's just certain things I can't be happy without. I've got to have that 120-inch high-def, you know, LED OSQ TV, you know, and I got to have the sports package and surround sound, and we got to, you know, I can't be happy without that. Let me give you a better solution. Find a friend who has all that. <laughs> Watch the game at his house. Eat his potato chips. It's perfect. I bought a ski boat. And uh, my, my brother-in-law, I, I told Kip, I said, hey, I, I know a guy's going bankrupt. He's trying to unload this pontoon boat. If we had both, man, we could put the whole family on the water at one time. I got this ski boat. You get the pontoon boat. He said, you know what? I'm more of a borrow your boat kind of guy. <laughs> Smart. Kip's way smarter than I am. Okay. So you know what? You can find a way to be happy without having all that stuff that, that th you think you have to have. The third lie is that big items have to be financed. If you're ever going to have something nice and big, I sent you up too soon. Don't let them cry yet. I'm, I'm going to play that later and I'll get real emotional. <laughs> if, if you ever look at like, I, I need new this, you know, I, I need new furniture. Our culture says we have to finance that. Go ahead and get it. I, I need some new technology. I'll go ahead and finance that. I'll go ahead and get it. Or I need a new car, I'll go ahead and finance that and I'll go ahead and get it. Well, you ask yourself, is that absolutely necessary? What if you started paying for cars with cash? Now, some of you just turned me off right there. Oh, he's talking to the rich people. Actually, it costs less to pay with cash. Did you know that? If you can afford to pay the interest and the car note, then you can definitely afford to pay just for the car. What you have to do is you have to wait. You have, to, you have to pay yourself first. Here's what I did. Years ago, when we paid off our last car loan, I kept the old car, and we kept paying the car note, but we paid it to ourselves. And instead of the bank getting that interest, now I started getting that interest. And after a while, that payment built up enough that I could pay for the next car in cash. And then I kept making the payment, but I made it to myself, right? And so I made that car. Now, you salesmen don't throw anything at me. I, I love y'all, and I appreciate y'all's tithe. Keep it coming. We need you, okay? But you need to have a personal idea of what God wants in your life and stop believing the lies that are around us. I, some, a lady told me one time, she said, Pastor, I've been praying for a financial breakthrough, and I came home, and I opened up the mailbox, and there it was, a pre-approved credit card. 
I said, God did not answer you. That was the devil. <laughs> tear it up and take all those other credit cards and tear them up too. Can I hear an amen? It's not God's plan for your life. Okay, so maybe you're a slave to the lender. Maybe you've been deceived. And here's the most likely. Maybe you have no personal financial vision. Do you have a vision for your life? And did you know that you are right now living someone's vision for your finances? Either yours or someone else's. Might be a finance company's. Okay, might be a salesman's vision for your finances. Might be a banker's, might be a credit card company's. But what is your vision? See, the problem in America is we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. Have you ever thought about that, how ridiculous that is? To buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. Why do we do that? Because we don't have vision. We don't have any restraint. You know, if I don't know where my money is supposed to go, my money could go anywhere. And actually, the wisest man who ever lived said that. Where there's no vision, the people are what? Unrestrained. There's no restraint. I'll just buy this. I'll buy that. I'll do whatever everybody else is doing in my family, everybody else in the culture. Let me just close with a little bit of my family vision, okay? We, we have a financial vision for our family. And I want you to understand that you can, you can develop one. Get, get it home with your spouse. If you're unmarried, talk to a, a godly person in your life. Determine what your family financial vision should look like. Then it's got guardrails. And you're not going to go off. The, you're going to actually get to where you're trying to go. Now, we've done pretty well in this. I could give you a lot of other things that we've done poorly, okay? But let me just share this one. First of all, we decided we were going to do ministry with no financial limitations okay I started that early on I knew I wanted to be in ministry and so I've never taken a church job where I knew what I was going to make never knew just just never knew because we knew God was calling us to do it and whenever we got there if they decided to give us some money we were like okay this is how much we've got and what that meant was our vision could not include credit card debt our families never had credit card debt we never paid one penny of credit card debt well y'all are rich no y'all are the rich ones the ones that use these credit cards. Because you can afford to pay 140%. I'm only paying 100%. I told y'all if you don't say amen, I'll start over. Y'all are... It just not, couldn't be a part of our vision. We, we couldn't afford to do that. So we had to make different decisions. And the financial decisions are easier when you know where you're going. The second part was we wanted to give more and more as a family. And so we, we started out as tithers. I told you in 1995, we became double tithers. We continued to give beyond that. We've started a family foundation. We've given over 50 pastors a free vacation over the last several years as a part of our family foundation because that's a part of our family vision. Other people have helped. It hasn't just been us paying for it. Other people have helped, but that's a part of our vision. Ministers are in crisis around the world. We wanted to do something to help them. That's a part of our vision. Another part was we wanted to provide a good education for our kids. So we set up a 529 plan. The money's gone before I knew it. I don't get to spend it because it's somewhere else, earning interest. Paid for my first kid to go to college only on the interest. Never touched the principal. It's a good, good system. Another part of our vision was to be able to retire. So early on, we started putting away money in retirement. Here, here's how I have lived most of my adult life. I call it effectively broke. Does anybody know how to live broke? Have you ever in your life, up to and including today, had to live broke? Come on, raise your hand if you know how to do it. Okay. A lot of you have had to do that, right? I started in ministry, and we weren't effectively broke. We were broke, broke. Okay. Literally like people put groceries on the front porch, you know, just like strangers. Or we probably knew them, but we didn't know who they were. They just donated it. Okay. That's how broke we were. And then we get a little pay raise. Now listen to this system. As soon as that pay raise comes to us, it never hits our checking account. It immediately went out somewhere else, so we couldn't touch it. First thing it did is a little bit of money went to a retirement account 30 years ago. And then we keep working and keep serving, and then we get a little pay raise. Well, then that money went to a car fund. One day we'll be able to buy a car. That car fund became a car and wedding fund. You ever paid for a wedding? Woo, you better have a fund, brother. You better have a fund. And then uh, eventually it was an education fund. And every time we got a pay raise... Listen, this is important. My vision told me where that money was going to go. If you don't have a vision, then pop culture is going to tell you where it goes. 
Well, and your kids are going to tell you where it goes. Dad, this kid gets private lessons. This kid over here gets a special baseball bat. This kid over here gets all this kind of stuff. Don't let your kid tell you where it's going to go. Let your vision tell you where it's going to go. I'm convinced I, if there's 52 Sundays of the year, this may be your least favorite one, but it'll be the best work I do for you this whole year long if you hear my heart. Amen. I want you to be free. I want you to not let the enemy and the world around you control who you are. Make up your mind. You got to work hard at it. You know, when I started out, when, when we'd go through the drive through like I wouldn't buy the combo because I realized you could go to the gas station and get the Coke cheaper than you got it at McDonald's through the combo. This is how cheap I am. We go through the drive through No, we won't want the Coke. And then we pull over to the gas station next door to save 48 cents. Anybody as cheap as I am in here? I remember the first time I got a gift for the little uh, Keurig coffee things. You stick to the Keurig. I remembered this story as I was leaving a hotel room last week, and I scooped up the extra K-cups. Do you all do that when you leave the hotel? <laughs> hey, I paid for that, brother. I'm taking the K-cups home with me. And I just remembered, hey, I no longer use them twice. See, I did the math on it, and, and it was like, I don't remember, over 50 cents for one cup of coffee. I thought, that's too high. So I ran the K-cup through it twice to get two cups of coffee out of that. Some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. You go to six bucks every day. I'm at Starbucks every day. So you, you got a different economic model for yourself, all right? But you got to decide, and, and you know, I, I, I joked about that to one of our staff members one time, and he said, you don't understand, that's part of my uh, mental health uh, plan right there. <laughs> if I don't have it, I'm going to go crazy. And I said, well, go on with it then. You need to determine who has God called our family to be. Listen, what I'm trying to do today is be your pastor. I'm trying to be your pastor. I'm not trying to just be your friend. I'm not trying to sell a book. I'm not trying to get on TBN. I'm not trying to whip you up into a frenzy. I'm trying to tell you that God already thought of every need that you have in your life, and these biblical principles will get you there. Now, I know this is a very, very difficult message for some people hearing my voice because some of you are this deep, and you're just barely holding your nose above water financially. The thought of saving, you, you can't save. You have nothing to save. The thought of giving, there's no room for you. You know you can give time, though. You can love people. You can serve. There's always a way to give. But I, I want to tell you, I have been right where you are. I don't think there's anybody here any poorer than I have been in my life. I've been very, very poor. When our first baby was born, the government gave us the, the, the help, the, the WIC program. Those of you that have been paying taxes a long time, I want to formally thank you for it. The government gave me some of that. I appreciate it. I have more than given it back. Can I hear an amen? amen. They will always take it back. But I've, I've been as, as, as poor as anybody in this room. And... Not, not big chunk of money or big salary is not what changed my life, but specifically doing the thing the Bible tells to do, being a generous person, being a tither. The Bible says God will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing in your life. Does anybody know what I'm talking about to be true? If God's been good to you in that way, would you praise him right now? Would you just thank him? God, we praise you and we give you the glory for it.